On this week's Carrier app, we will dissect some of the top news stories from the carrier space over the past week, as well as talk with Dan Hayes from PwC about the upcoming 600 megahertz incentive auction. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. Well, thanks for joining us in this week's Carrier Wrap. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Dan Meyer, your editor at uh, RCR Wireless News. And joining me this week is uh, Sean Kinney, our managing editor. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Dan. It's been a couple weeks on the show with you. It has been, yes. It's, uh, I think this is our first show together of the new year. So happy new year to you there. And uh, thanks for joining us on this week's show. Yeah, you too, man. Are you fully recovered from a consumer electronics show? Uh, I believe I am. I know you were there in force. I know lots of great stories from you at the show. So uh, you look like you're doing okay. Again, you're a younger gentleman, so I'm sure you can handle those shows a little bit than I can, but uh, you look like you're doing okay. Doesn't make me like them anymore. <laughs> Very good. Well, we're going to start the show uh, like we do. We like to start these, these shows kind of looking at some of the past, uh, uh, some news events of the past week in the carrier space. And I think uh, for both of us, me and Sean, I think the one we definitely want to touch on this week was uh, the story that came out late last week uh, from another publication. Uh, talking about Sprint uh, possibly revamping its whole network again. Uh, as we all know, Sprint has a, a bit of a history in uh, rejiggering its network a little bit and, of course, having uh, catastrophic results from those uh, efforts. Uh, so, again, some story came out that they were looking to, again, do some changes to its network there. And I know I know we've talked about this a little bit offline, Sean, but uh, I know you were uh, a bit aghast by the whole thing again and maybe even a bit uh, quizzical of the uh, nature of this rumor that could be coming along. So maybe get your insight on maybe what you, we, what you I guess, take from, from what kind of came out and again, the impact it had on Sprint. Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's the, the really important thing to keep in mind here is that everything that we're about to talk about <laughs> is completely unsubstantiated by Sprint, right? Yes. So that's the baseline. Uh, this started on Friday with a very brief article in Recode that cited people close to the network overhaul plan. And it essentially, it says that Sprint is going to start to divest itself of lease arrangements with companies like Crown, companies like SBAC, companies like uh, American Tower, and that they're going to gradually reposition their network infrastructure onto sites owned by municipalities, government entities, and utility companies yes. so that they can avoid the expensive leasing arrangements that make companies like Crown and American Tower so profitable. <laughs> this article, I mean, I must have completely underestimated the power that Recode has on the global economy. <laughs> this article, I, I mean, I think, uh, I don't remember the percentages of each, but Crown, SBAC, and American Tower all saw whole number declines in their stock value. Sprints went down 9%. Yeah, nine percent of the stock value of a multi-billion-dollar top four U.S. mobile carrier, based off of a six-paragraph article. Yes, yes. Well, I guess, I guess we can just assume that Recode is the China of of the U.S. I guess. I mean, anything that they do pretty much impacts the industry. But but yeah, I mean, again, and, and it was. I mean, the, the story did have some anonymous sources. Uh, you know, as we've kind of come to see, perhaps some of the sources are maybe a little bit confused, perhaps. But again, yeah, we haven't gotten any, any word from Sprint. I've got a couple of calls into Sprint. Have heard anything back from Sprint? Uh, there's, been, there's been some changes internally at Sprint, so uh, some of the contacts perhaps are a little bit busy at this time at this point. But uh, but yeah, but definitely, definitely very interesting. Yeah, I just I uh, I I would have never seen a big stock loss associated with with just this. But uh, you know, for almost a year, we've been talking about Sprint's network improvement plan yeah. is perhaps revolving around deployment of somewhere between fifty thousand and seventy thousand small cell sites. We might be getting a little closer to understanding what that actually is, and the the term I've I've seen and I've heard related to this is macro mini sites. Yeah. So not exactly a small cell, but a scaled down macro site that's placed somewhere where they have an you know advantageous leasing arrangement that costs less than what they have in place now. Yeah. So. To my wit, at least, you mentioned Splint, Sprint's big internal restructuring as it comes to staffing. Uh, part of that is a decentralization out of Overland Park there, and they're setting up shop in uh, 19 major metropolitan markets. Uh, I think it's it's easy to infer this close Sprint association with these cities is probably meant 
to ease this transition from privately leased sites over to sites that are collaboratively set up with government entities. I think that's a, a fair thing to kind of assume. Yep. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is something you and I talked about uh, many episodes <laughs> back on this show, but what exactly is SoftBank's appetite here as yeah. it relates to Sprint? I mean, a 9% day over day stock loss and yeah, you know, that's a good point. Yeah, not a lot of signs of life on any of the other, you know, KPIs that you'd look at as it relates to a carrier. So, I mean, how much money are they going to continue to put into Sprint? I, I really don't know. And, uh, you know, the, yeah, that's gonna be, yeah, that's a good question. Stuff. Again, it's something, you know, they've invested 20 something, $22 billion in a Sprint. Uh, it seems like that value has just uh, gone down from day one. Uh, and, and you're right, they, they pumped some more money in there, bought in some new executives, definitely rechange a lot of the, the organization there, at least the structure. Uh, of the organization, but you're right. It does seem like Sprint has still not been able to really claw its way back to any sort of semblance of uh, of, a, of a thriving company. Uh, you know, again, we'll see what the results are for their fourth quarter coming out here here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but you're right. I think yeah, I think there's been some stories even circulating about SoftBank's appetite getting a little uh, for this kind of this kind of abuse, uh, perhaps waning a bit too. So uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. But again, you know, I, I'm guessing there's not a lot of companies lined up to buy the Sprint assets. I mean, Sprint owns a lot of Spectrum. They own a lot of towers. They have customers. So, I mean, they're, they're a legitimate business, uh, but their operations are definitely uh, in shambles, it seems like, at this point, and they're just trying to scramble to find some way to, to right the ship here. Uh, I, I think we've used that term. I know I've used that term several times on the show before, so uh, it seems like an ongoing effort there at Sprint. So um, that's, that's a big challenge. And again, you know, again, you mentioned the decentralization part of it. And I think that might go back a bit to, you know, last year they put a lot of emphasis on the Chicago market. They, they did a lot of stuff in Chicago. That was giving me their, their kind of a, you know, their, their guiding light to how they're going to start doing these big markets. And they worked, as part of that Chicago move, they did work very closely with the local government there. A lot of uh, announcements with the, with the mayor there in Chicago about some initiatives. And it did seem like that could be a way for Sprint to perhaps, you know, get a little closer to the local government that could perhaps lead to them getting access to maybe some uh, local uh, local sites as well, some, some government sites. So, Perhaps that was one of the ways. Again, there seems to be a lot of a uh, lot of breadcrumbs here, kind of leading to perhaps why this read codes read codes read code story got so much momentum is because you're right. I mean, there was the the their plan to do smaller cells, uh, you know, kind of their work with these these cities. Uh, again, their network has just been in shambles. It seems like anyway. So I, I think people kind of maybe put all these pieces together and came up with the wrong the wrong the wrong answer, perhaps. But still, there are so many issues out there with Sprint that could lead one to assume that maybe this is maybe perhaps legitimate. Yeah, and I guess one other thing that that concerns me uh, to the extent that I'm concerned about <laughs> um, is, that, is that, you know, we, we talk about 5G constantly and, you know, the standard's not set and we're years away from it, but it's going to require ultra dense metropolitan yeah. networks replete with macro sites, small cell, Wi-Fi, DAS at all. Yeah. So for a while, when we thought that Sprint was going to undertake a massive rollout of small cells, which seems like it might not exactly be the case anymore, at that point I was thinking, okay, great. They're going to make their 4G network better, and they're going to set up these right-of-way accesses, these fiber accesses, and these power accesses that they'll need when they eventually upgrade, which, you know, five, six, seven years. That's not that long a time when you're talking about planning for a company this size. So now we seem to be backing away from that small cell thing. And it basically seems like they're reconfiguring their macro layer to make the leases cheaper, yeah. which, you know, that might be great for saving some money today yeah. and in 2016, but where's the strategy involved in that? Yeah. Is it, are they just going to have to do some massive, something different four years from now or, you know, wait a couple years to commercialize on 5g and just totally get left behind. I just, I really don't understand the entirety of the situation. I understand parts of it, but I don't understand how it all fits together, which makes me, as I said, concerned to the extent that I am concerned about Sprint. Yeah, that's a good point. And again, you know, we're kind of still waiting for an official word from Sprint. And again, they're going to announce the results here in the next couple of weeks. So perhaps we'll provide some clarity on this. But again, when your Sprint's, you know, when, you're, when your stock drops almost 10%, on, on a rumor, uh, you know, if, it's, if the rumor is false, you would think that Sprint might want to get out ahead of that uh, just to kind of, you know, at least, you know, it's done the flow there, but of their stock uh, valuation. But uh, again, no word yet from Sprint on this. And so we're still kind of waiting for that to kind of finalize it. So again, like we said at the beginning, you know, what we're, what we're talking about here are still strictly rumors. Uh, we don't have any official words from Sprint on what their plans are going to be. But uh, regardless, uh, it did seem that the stock market took uh, what was said to heart. 
and uh, started uh, fleeing in mass from uh, from Sprint stock. So uh, interesting. But we'll, well, again, we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks. But uh, uh, again, Sprint's always a good t- topic of conversation on this show. But uh, uh, but I know another topic I want to touch on a bit with you. And then she had some more words there for Sprint. I know you were worked up on the Sprint topic. I don't know if you anything else you want to um, say about Sprint. Yeah, call us. Help us understand this. You know, Dan's easy to get a hold of. <laughs> I'm right here. I'm waiting by the phone. Uh, but anyway, so another topic I want to touch on a bit was um, uh, this week, uh, Verizon came out finally with its uh, sponsored data program. Uh, they've been rumored to be doing this for a while now. Uh, ATT had done something similar uh, last year, you know, 2014. Uh, so it's been out there for a while. Uh, so Verizon came out with its program uh, this week called uh, Freebie, which is very cute. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, again, a program to kind of allow advertisers, content providers, to basically uh, provide you know, uh, free data to an extent to, to customers to kind of check out their, their stuff there. Uh, again, probably not a huge uh, initial thing, but it, it, this is one of those topics that's kind of been gaining steam over the past several years, this whole sponsored data. And you know, carriers have been kind of cutting back on, on the data for consumers or at least increasing the pricing on it. Uh, and so it seems like this is a way perhaps for uh, consumers, you know, if they're willing to put up with uh, maybe some advertisements, uh, to get some free data. I don't know. Again, you are, again, a little younger than I am, perhaps more of the uh, target market for this kind of thing. What's your view on kind of this, this sponsored data and maybe what Verizon is doing there? Well, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, I, I've read our coverage and I've read other people's coverage about sponsored data. Uh, I did some research before we got on this call to kind of understand how will I interact with this? What's this like for a user? So for all our viewers who go to airports and use that free 90 minute complimentary Wi-Fi where before you can access the network, you watch a video. Mm-hmm. That's this, this is what we're talking about. Uh, and you asked me, I don't really know who this is for. And, <laughs> and you know, and, and granted there's still beta uh, testing yeah. all of this with a very limited user pool, very limited content pool. I would imagine it's something to the effect of say you're searching for some kind of YouTube video. You find one that meshes with your keyword search, you click on it. Then you'll see an icon, a little a freebie, uh, yeah. and it'll be right up there next to the video saying, well, you know, you could watch this video and have it hit your data bucket, or you could watch it through Phoebe, and we'll give you a little pre-roll advertisement, and Chevy or whoever's going to pick up the tab for the data. Yeah. I don't understand the data threshold involved here to where... I, I guess, I don't know. I mean, how much, how little data do these people have that like a 30 <laughs> second video is going to make or break it? Like I could get it if I wanted to watch like a movie, yeah, like a theatrical film yes. that was 90 plus minutes long, but I don't really see the, the value to the sponsor in that regard. Cause I mean, somebody's going to pay for it at some point and I just when it when it seems that it would be useful is when it also seems that it would have no value to the sponsor. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's an interesting because again, I know again, like we said, ATT rolled this out a couple of years ago, and so it's been out there, it's been available, and yeah, I don't think we've seen you know perhaps I haven't looked hard enough, but I haven't seen much of an impact of this or even a lot of talk about it. I know ATT's tried to kind of boost it a little bit more recently, uh, but there hasn't been a lot of traction. It seems like with this, and I agree with you. It, it seems like it's a it's a, an interesting idea. Uh, but it's just str- it's, it's struggling to get a market, I think, out there. Because again, I agree with you. I think you know either consumers will go to Wi-Fi and not even worry about it, or uh, there's so many other options out there. I think for consumers uh, that it does seem like a strange market, and that's why perhaps even talking about it, perhaps we're just boosting more than it needs to be talked about. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, idea that just didn't seem to really find a market. Yeah, I, I assume they're going to re- you know refine this through beta testing and through trials, and maybe we'll see something that you know confounds my. <laughs> preconceived notions of what it is by the time it's actually available to everybody. But right now, you know, you ask me, would I use this? I mean, even if we go back to that 30 second YouTube video, if I have to take it and then watch the video as opposed to click and play and watching the video, I ain't going to split 45 seconds of data. I'm going to watch that thing in the most direct manner possible, which probably isn't going to be clicking on a cute little B icon. Yeah. So I, I just, again, don't know who it's for. Wish them the best of luck. Yeah. yeah and again, the, 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 the companies they announced initially are, that are part of this are, are definitely maybe more straight advertisers too. I mean, AOL is part of it. AOL is part of Verizon. So I don't really consider them much of a customer for this. Uh, but, but yeah, I agree. It, it does seem like, like you said, though, I think as a, perhaps as a, as a movie kind of thing, perhaps that makes some sense at least. You know, hey, watch a minute you know, uh, of, of an advertisement and you can watch a two-hour movie for, for little or no charge to your data bucket. That can make some sense. Uh, you know, obviously with T-Mobile doing their Ben John thing, they've really jumped into that video 
uh, streaming video market pretty hard. So perhaps this is a way for, you know, for Verizon or AT&T to maybe kind of ne- nudge that way without, you know, full bore going in and not, you know, not charging it all for it. But, but yeah, it does seem like it's, it's perhaps maybe leading to something else. It's just a matter of, I guess, waiting for what that something else will be uh, to make it more compelling. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, as it sort of takes shape over the betas, we'll continue to cover it and look at the different use cases and applications. But I mean, even back to that movie uh, analogy, you know, and I, I keep my eyes peeled. I don't see a lot of people watching movies on cell phones. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good I point. don't. And I, you know, I'm constantly at convention centers and airports and looking around to just see if I can spot it in the wild. Oh, hey, look, he's watching. I've never, never seen it. <laughs> Well, if you're not seeing it, it's on authors. That's why I look at it. But, uh, but maybe, one, maybe, one, maybe one final topic. This was kind of from last week. I wanted to touch on one more thing. Was, uh, uh, I have to, I'd like to bring in John, John uh, Le, Legere from um, uh, T-Mobile, CEO, CEO on any conversation we can possibly have. Uh, but uh, last week he came out and apologized to the extent to uh, some comments he had made uh, about a, a consumer group that was uh, just put out some information about the Ben John service. That's, that's had a lot of, the first part of the year here has been a lot of talk about the Ben John service and the impact of it and net neutrality and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so uh, he came out initially and kind of made some comments about a, a consumer group, uh, not necessarily dissing the program, but just laying out some facts about the program. Uh, and he said it was causing some confusion in the market. So he came out against what they were saying. And he came out early last week and you know, maybe tempered his, uh, his comments a little bit saying, hey, I didn't really mean to jump on their case. Obviously, we're all looking out for the consumer at the end of the day here. Uh, whether that's true or not, who really knows? But uh, but he came out. It was actually I, for myself. I wrote a, a my worst week column must be kind of touched on it because it was nice to kind of see him, uh, you know, a little bit uh, taking a step back from his normal uh, grandiose comments. Uh, but uh, but I don't want to see this happen long term for him. I like him being the crazy guy out there. I don't want to see him all of a sudden become a little timid. But uh, I don't know what was your thought on. I guess I guess the comments from from John and you know hopefully not seeing him uh, lose his lose his focus. Yeah, the organization here is the uh, Electronics Frontier Foundation. And uh, who knew that that's what it would take to get Legere to <laughs> apologize for anything? As much, as much commentary as that guy puts out into the world via Periscope, via Twitter, via press interviews, whatever, this is what it took. So now I'm curious what happened behind the scenes and who works at or funds the EFF because whoever that person is, they got some swing. (laughs) And, uh, you know, just to talk about this net neutrality issue, you know, it's interesting. We haven't really started the regulatory machinations and analysis of things like binge on where there is a question there and there is sort of disagreement at the uh, FCC level about it. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, to look at some cues, you can you can go abroad. Uh, Internet.org they offer their free basics, which uh, you know undeveloped parts of the world. If you want to get on Wikipedia or Facebook, it's not going to count against your data plan. This is meant to be inclusive, meant to be accessible. Facebook's leading this with carrier partners in different markets. It's uh, Reliance over in India. Yeah. Telecommunications regulator in India has asked Reliance to shut this down because it violates net neutrality by creating a walled garden where, yes, you can access this content, but only this content that I pick. Yeah. So that's how they're handling it abroad. It'll be interesting to see if that sort of sentiment actually colors the issue here at home. But, you know, I, it's, it's been interesting to follow because I, both sides of the issue, does it violate, does it not violate, have been very well articulated by their proponents. And uh, yeah, it, it seems like something that needs guidance from a yeah. federal level because it's it's ambiguous yeah i agree and I, I think you know for myself from a personal point of view i think t-mobile's done a very good job with the binge on service again they allow customers to turn it on turn it off um you know obviously they are kind of controlling who their partners are but they're trying to make it sound like they're very open about it i mean obviously youtube is not part of that and which is owned by google uh and so they're a big uh, opponent of this uh so that's you know they have a lot of sway when it comes to to, to, to dc and to regulatory uh, issues so uh, but again, I, I like I like the way they've done it. I think it's you know it's an innovative way to kind of tackle this. Uh, uh, but again, you know, net neutrality is a whole whole different kind of worms there. And again, you know, we're looking about you know eight months from now, nine months from now, uh, elections anyway are coming up, and the administration could change, uh, the leadership, of the FCC could change, and so the whole viewpoint of net neutrality could be challenged. You know, ten months from now, it could be a whole different viewpoint there. So uh it's gonna be interesting to see if the fcc looks to tackle this situation over the next nine or ten months i mean the fcc is gonna be busy uh with a spectrum auction coming up here pretty soon uh so they're gonna have their hands full of all different things 
Uh, so yeah, I'm curious to whether this will be a huge issue or not going forward and whether they just wait to push off and just let the next administration uh, take, take advantage or you know, take charge of the situation and let them deal with it. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that, I think to me at least, how that plays out, but, uh, but we'll see on that. I don't know um, how that all plays out. But anyway, uh, enough of our rambling on this. Uh, you know, speaking of, of the Spectrum auction itself, uh, I had a chance uh, earlier this week to speak with Dan Hayes from PwC about the upcoming uh, 600 megahertz spectrum auction. Uh, PwC has been doing a lot of work lately, working with broadcasters and carriers about their planning and their strategy for this auction. It's going to be a very complicated auction process. Uh, set to kick off on March 29th with a reverse auction with broadcasters giving up spectrum perhaps, uh, and then go from that to a forward auction with carriers bidding on that spectrum. Uh, so it's a very complicated process. Again, I spoke with Dan about some of the topics there, what he's seeing in the market, uh, maybe trying to you know, kind of reduce some of the complications in the process. But, uh, but again, let's take a look at the interview now and uh, get some more insight there. So uh, there we go. All right, well, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, this week, we are joined by Dan Hayes, who's the uh, principal for uh, PwC Strategy and Consulting to talk a bit about uh, Spectrum and the fun world of Spectrum. Obviously, in the wireless industry, Spectrum is the lifeblood of, of the industry. And uh, we had a very successful auction last year of Spectrum. And uh, between now and then, uh, there's been no, no lessening of demand for Spectrum. And so we've got another auction coming up uh, here in the next couple of months, a very complicated uh, incentive auction process. So we're going to get some insight from Dan on what's been going on there. So, hey, Dan, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Yeah, Dan, thanks so much for having me. This is a great topic and definitely going to be one of the big, big focus subjects for the industry for this year. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I know last year, obviously, I think people were still kind of coming down off of the high or whatever it was from the AWS3 auction, which generated more than $40 billion. I think it took a, a few months to kind of absorb uh, what happened there. But, uh, uh, but again, yeah, you're right. You kind of jump right back in. We got the 600 megahertz incentive auction coming up. Uh, set to start uh, end of March. Obviously, uh, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler is uh, adamant it will start on time and it will be successful and it will be uh, fun. Uh, so, uh, so I guess, you know, I mean, I guess as we look over the past year and kind of leading up to what's coming up this year, I mean, what's been your general view of, of I guess, you know, how this incentive auction has kind of been put together and how it's been supported by, by the FCC, by broadcasters, by, by the industry itself? Yeah, well, look, this, this is really an, an exciting auction and one that is uh, the first ever of its kind, right? We've never had an auction here in the U.S. where we've actually had the government buying back spectrum from commercial entities, right? This took an act of Congress literally <laughs> to make it work. So the fact that it's taken us quite some time to, in the run up to actually getting the applications in, it is not really a surprise to anybody. I have to say, I, I think that it's gone pretty smoothly. In fact, maybe more smoothly than just about anybody anticipated at this point. You know, I, I look at the last year, quite frankly, as more of an education process than anything. Here you have a group of broadcasters who really don't think about spectrum every day, right? They, they've had it, they've had it in many cases for decades, but it's not something that they deal with lots of changes. They're not usually out there looking for more. If anything, we've seen their, their spectrum get nibbled away over the last, you know, 15, 20 years as we've transitioned to digital and some of that and redeployed for recent months has been to educate the broadcasters, get them on board. And quite frankly, uh, all of our views from talking to many, many broadcasters out there across the country in recent months is uh, our view is that they are uh, led to some broadcast participation in this auction. Yeah, that's a good point because it does seem like that there has been, you know, like you said, over the past year, it has been a kind of a big uh, learning experience because this is a extremely complicated auction process. Uh, I think the FCC is, you know, they even admitted that this is a, a lot of work involved with this. I know uh, Chairman Wheeler has been uh, adamant about working with the broadcasters on this, uh, really going out to the broadcasters and saying, hey, this is, you know, kind of laying it out initially as being a very open and receptive kind of thing, but then at times, being somewhat forceful, saying, "Hey, you know, this is an opportunity for you guys. We're not gonna, we're not gonna screw around with this. It's gonna be a serious auction." And and then I, I and actually going to the to the uh, carriers too, the to wireless industry, saying, "Hey, look, you guys, if you guys want the spectrum, you have to really show your support uh, that you want this to make sure the broadcasters realize what's happening." So you're right. I mean, the past year has been, uh, I, yeah, it does seem like this has done a pretty good job of really bringing everybody together on the same uh, on the same uh, page with this because, again, very very complicated process to get got, got going forward for this. Yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of economists working overtime to make this auction happen, to design it, and to make it, quite frankly, I think as bulletproof as you could get in an auction where you've got both a reverse and a forward auction happening, 
you know, not at exactly the same time, but, but be, having to be synchronized in a large way. So I, I think that they've done a good job with that. You know, quite frankly, the results from last year's AWS 3 auction that you alluded to uh, did a, a really nice job of waking up the broadcast community to the potential of what they could be seeing out of an auction for this spectrum, which is, you know, arguably by most, a, a, by most accounts, a, uh, a better band, a more attractive band uh, for wireless use. You know, in addition to that, I think that the opening bid prices that were published last year really, uh, you know, stoked the enthusiasm of broadcasters to, to make them want to participate in this. Now, we don't expect that the actual auction prices for the vast majority of stations are going to be anywhere close to those auctioning bid prices, keeping in mind that this is a declining auction, yeah, yeah. but for the broadcasters at least. Yeah. But, you know, those numbers uh, really are big. And when you're a broadcaster and you could be looking at an opening bid price that's you know, 10, 20, 30 times the value of your organization, uh, you know, that, that's enough to get anybody's attention. Yeah. So we think that it's, they've done a really nice job in, in pulling that together. You know, the other thing is that the, uh, the, the process, I think the education process, we've had the government going out doing their roadshow with the broadcasters that's helped to get everybody on board. Um, we've seen a lot of the uh, quite frankly, the, the FCC regulatory and legal community really rallying uh, to get people behind this, uh, this spectrum and to also help with the education process. So all in all, I, I think it's been quite positive. And, and on the sell side, though we saw a lot of skepticism. I don't think we're going to see any, uh, any real issues here. and We're expecting to see a full slate of broadcasters stepping up to the table, at least with a willingness to look at selling their spectrum during the auction. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think that AWS result really kind of woke up the broadcasters because again, it did seem like leading up to that point, there seemed like there was some animosity out there. Maybe, maybe that's not the right word for it. But it seemed like there was some some issues, perhaps, on the broadcast side that you know they were maybe posturing a bit or grandstanding about what they wanted to do with this, and you know. But it did seem like yeah, once those numbers came in for AWS three, uh, it did seem like kind of uh, it got smoother along the process, or at least at least from the outside looking in, it seemed like it got a lot smoother. Uh, with broadcasters perhaps saying, okay, you know, I mean, there's, there was a court decision obviously that helped as well, uh, but it did seem like it kind of uh, smoothed out a bit and uh, it did get broadcasters a, a attention. And again, like you said too, from the sales side, uh, you know, barring one carrier who said they're not going to participate, uh, for the most part, it does seem like we're going to get some good, at least some good participation from the, from the commercial wireless side of this as well. The big guys that can be involved, T-Mobile's been very aggressive. Uh, even the rural guys have talked about getting involved as well too. So it should be uh, pretty good from the sell side. Are you seeing some pretty good, I guess, uh, I'm guessing, uh, interest from, from the commercial providers? Yeah, I think the sell side is, is still, it, it's probably going to be the most interesting part mm -hmm. of the auction as we head into it. Um, and, you know, obviously we're not going to know results from the auction until we, we think probably the end of the third quarter of, uh, of 2016 at, at best. Yeah. So hey, we've still got a few months ahead of us to really make this happen. But, you know, I think that we've seen great commitments from several of the wireless operators, you know, saying that they're going to commit billions of dollars uh, to this auction. But you know what? I think if, if previous auctions, including AWS3, if those are any indication, what's really going to make this auction go is going to be the participation of a couple of, uh, of, of outside sort of dark horse candidates. Um, we're going to, we're going to see, you know, the usual, the wireless guys, yeah, they'll be there. Uh, right. They're, they're always there. They're always spectrum hungry. They, they need more. And this is a great band, but we think that there's two groups of, of sort of outside candidates that could really make this spectrum or uh, uh, make this auction a runaway hit, right? The first one is the, the cable companies. Um, you know, we know that all the cable companies, and they've not made any secret of this in the U.S., that, that they really still lack a solid wireless play. Many of them have moved in with very aggressive Wi-Fi plans. They're trying to market the, uh, the ability to take their content and their, and their access with them mm -hmm. to their customers. Uh, but really, they don't have a true mobility play today. So this, this 600 megahertz spectrum offers a great opportunity for one or more of them to step in and overlay a true mobile capability on top of you know, these vast, uh, by many accounts, millions of Wi-Fi hotspots mm -hmm. that they've got in existence. So that's going to be one interesting one. The second one, maybe even more exciting, 
is going to be the, the potential for participation from the tech industry. Um, you know, if I was a tech industry player and there's several out there with pretty deep pockets, yeah. uh, you know, this is a, this is a maybe once in a, in a lifetime opportunity, as many have coined it, mm -hmm. uh, to go in and buy some low band spectrum and really get yourself into the wireless business as a direct to consumer type of provider. And, and we've seen several in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that have had an appetite to make some pretty big plays in the access space, you know, whether it's on fiber, satellite, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, this could be very complimentary or maybe even something to layer on top of it. And particularly with, you know, with the, the growth in the, in the U.S. market sort of plateauing in terms of new subscribers, here's an opportunity to really go in and disintermediate the existing players or at least scoop up a piece of the market. Um, so some interesting opportunities there, you know, for some folks who, quite frankly, have the wallet to make it happen. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, but, but again, it always seems like, you know, the cable guys have talked about this for a long time and some of these new uh, tech guys, have, you know, they've, they've dabbled in these before. Uh, they've talked their, you know, their game. But at the end of the day, they've all kind of uh, cashed out their chips and kind of, uh, you know, gone back to their Wi-Fi. Uh, but I guess, but you're right, though. It does seem like the market has not... Uh, lesson. I mean, th this this move towards uh, taking your content everywhere is just growing and growing. I, I guess is that is that perhaps changed? I'm, I know you guys are talking to a lot of these companies, you know, with, with what you guys do there. But does it seem like it has the mindset changed enough at these big uh, companies to really this time be part of this? Do you think or because uh, you know, I mean, because why running a wireless network is not cheap. It's not easy. Uh, there are pitfalls everywhere. Uh, do Do you think it's it's perhaps changed a bit this time where the mindset is is different? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think that it is somewhat different. And okay. I've lost track by this point of how many generations, how many times the cable companies have tried to get into the wireless business, right? Whether yeah. it was MVNO partnerships, buying spectrum, whatever it may be, right? There have been multiple attempts yeah. and, and none of them have worked out to date. But I would actually argue that today we're at a different point in the evolution of the cable industry. And the reason for that is that their penetration of you know internet access people paying for broadband is actually starting to you know plateau and in, and in fact in some cases decline with the phenomenon of cord cutting in the cable industry and maybe even worse when you get into the the conversation about it for video yeah. um, so the cable companies surely have to be looking for more opportunities to replace and grow the revenue that they have. We've seen that recently with some of them launching over the top service offerings where you can be a video subscriber and not even have, you know, connectivity at home. So there's definitely an increased appetite there uh, to get into the wireless business. The other thing that's different now is, you know, whereas 10 or 15 years ago, they had strong coaxial, you know, networks out there, but they didn't really have the deep fiber networks. Today, you're seeing the cable companies arguably having the biggest fiber networks, you know, out there in many markets. And so their ability to, you know, basically backhaul themselves on a wireless yeah. network is really tremendous. So there's some things that are different. That said, it's definitely going to be a big leap for one or more of them to try and get into the wireless business. And, and we think they may not do it on their own. They may look to do some partnering. Yeah, you know, and kind of go down that road to defray some of their risk and all of this. Yeah, it can be interesting. And then again, like you said, this could be a very long-term ongoing auction that's going to take several months, uh, six, seven months perhaps uh, towards the end of the year really get, to get it going. But I guess maybe looking, you know, maybe taking a step back, uh, I guess how important is this auction to kind of freeing up more spectrum? Because it does seem like, uh, obviously, like we talked about, I mean, spectrum is a lifeblood for this wireless industry. Demand is always growing for it. Uh, and this auction does show... Uh, it seems that the government is willing to be very creative in how it goes about freeing up more spectrum. Because again, the process is going to be complicated. Uh, you know, this has taken a lot. You know, you know, a lot of work that they have to see to get this out, get this right. Uh, I guess how important is this auction to kind of both free up spectrum? I guess in the in the near term with this specific auction, but also looking ahead because this does seem like this will be a template for auctions perhaps going forward. So I guess the importance of, of this auction related to to, to, be, to make sure it's done right. Yeah, it, it's absolutely critical that they get this one right, and that's for multiple reasons. I mean, the, the United States is absolutely setting the benchmark for global regulators and global telecom communities around the world with this auction, right? I mean, I, I, I've heard from so many who are interested 
to see how this auction goes because they know that their own countries are going to have to replicate this auction going forward. That said, you know, you look at the amount of spectrum that could be freed up in this auction. Yeah, you know, by varying estimates, you know, the opening the opening uh, clearing target could be you know, maybe 114 or 126 megahertz, uh, which would be nearly a quarter, or in some cases a little over a quarter, of the 500 megahertz goal to clear that the current administration, you know, set in place with the first ever national broadband plan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that, that makes it really important. And in fact, you know, we've seen this sort of uh, relentless focus on getting the auction done this year. Interestingly, uh, trying to get it done before election season. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so that said, you know, uh, this is absolutely critical for, for everyone to execute uh, fairly flawlessly uh, in order to really set the stage for the future. Now, you know, will we see other incentive auctions in the future? Maybe. Uh, it's, it's still a little bit unclear, you know, just what other bands would really be able to utilize this. But you know, the government has, has hinted along the way that there could be future incentive auctions even for additional clearing of, of television broadcasters mm -hmm. you know, down the road. And that's probably several years away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it would definitely set the stage for something like that. But, you know, if we can get 120 megahertz or, you know, even 100 megahertz out of this auction, um, that goes a real long way towards meeting that 500 megahertz goal. And, and it, it also eases up some of the pressure on the government itself who you know has has been under uh, you know a tremendous amount of scrutiny to actually reduce its own use of spectrum and free up some of its inefficiently used spectrum for commercial use you know in the DoD or DOT or whomever. So this is a really big opportunity and an important one for the government. Yeah, well, that's a good point too. You kind of bring up the fact that you know obviously the government is being uh, pressured to kind of reduce its own usage or at least perhaps be a little more open and how it uses spectrum. And I know with AWS three and, and the whole AWS band for the most part, uh, sharing of spectrum uh, was kind of a big part of that, or at least reallocating you know Department of Defense to different parts. And, and it does seem like that that it is going to be more more necessary going forward to get more creative in how spectrum is being used out there. And again, whether it's sharing or reallocation or, or relocating people around. Uh, it does seem like that's going to be a big part of this going forward, and it does seem like uh, that the options for that, the technology is getting so much better now that these options are are possible now for spectrum sharing and other ways to do things. Uh, what kind of impact do you think that's going to have on, on I guess, I guess auction pl or uh, spectrum plans and even auction plans, I guess, going going forward? Is that going to be a bigger part? Do you think of what the FCC is going to be looking at in terms of freeing up additional spectrum down the road? Yeah, no question about it. I mean, and there's all sorts of levers that people are, are you know, playing with today. Uh, I spoke at a conference a few months ago with one of the senior spectrum officials in the Department of Defense. Yeah. And it was really interesting to hear his perspective on this. His whole talk was all about spectrum sharing. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was the first time that I can recall ever really seeing a, a, a senior US government official embrace the concept of sharing with commercial users. And there's some new technologies that are making that more viable, right? Some of the databasing that we have and more, uh, you know, geofencing of spectrum usage is making sharing, uh, you know, uh, more feasible for the government in ways that they, they never were really willing to, right? In the past, it was, if I was using it, even if it was in one little isolated portion of the country, I basically blocked off the whole country from <laughs> using that block. And, and that wasn't really an efficient use of a very, you know, limited natural resource. So that's, that's one viable thing. The other thing, you know, that we, we all have to keep in mind is we also have going on in parallel with this, the, the planning for the deployment of the FirstNet public safety broadband network, right? That's 20 megahertz of spectrum that the government has put forward and is actively encouraging sharing, you know, using priority access. Yeah. So first responders, you know, getting priority access to that network but really being able to utilize what, what we think is going to be the vast majority of the capacity of that network for commercial purposes. Um, in fact, it, it, it struck me as uh, really groundbreaking that when the government came out and, and asked for partners to help with the build out of that network, it, it's, not a, uh, it's not a bid for uh, you know, how much you're going to charge the government to build the network. It's actually a bid for how much you're going to pay the government <laughs> to utilize the spectrum. I mean, who's ever seen something like that? I mean, you know, that's essentially like a revenue share model with the government. That's pretty unheard of. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Obviously, yeah, the RFP just came out recently for FirstNet. And uh, yeah, and it does seem like the timing of that is interesting because, again, there is now this push to, yeah, to use that FirstNet spectrum, which is, again, 20 megahertz, a pretty much clean spectrum, uh, ready, to be, ready to be deployed today, really. Uh, obviously, with the broadcast spectrum, the 600 megahertz, you know, that's going to be a 39-month a, a process, really, before that really can even be freed up. So, you know, for carriers who are looking for spectrum uh, in the near term, uh, and some operators have spectrum adjacent to the uh, to the band 14 there as well. So uh, it could be a very easy, quick way, uh, relatively, uh, to to get access to some spectrum. And again, yeah, obviously the, the the business model will be a little different, but uh, but you know that's valuable spectrum just kind of sitting there. And it's been interesting to see what impact that might have also kind of on the on the spectrum plans because one of those operators has been uh, a bit wishy-washy on what their plans are going to be for the broadcast spectrum. And so perhaps they're looking at. Uh, at the uh, at that band 14 there and saying hey this could be uh, perhaps a good, a good way for us to go as well too so uh. yeah no it's it's very true and and I would say you know even in the broadcast auction uh, it's it hasn't been talked a lot or talked about a lot but there's also a provision in the broadcast spectrum auction where depending upon the broadcaster participation um, there's the there's the potential that there will be some impaired blocks of yeah. spectrum that will still get auctioned off and licensed to uh, you know, to the wireless carriers, but we'll, you know, we'll still have to deal with, deal with interference issues uh, from broadcasters. Uh, the broadcasters are certainly, you know, a little bit concerned about that, but I think that the wireless community is is uh, rightfully more concerned and, and also, you know, concerned about what this may mean for the value that's realized in the, in this upcoming auction. So it's a bit of a wait and see, but uh, that, that's going to be one interesting dimension that we're keeping an eye on. Yeah, that's true. Like I said, impairment part of it, it does seem like the FCC is not assuming, but uh, I guess planning at some point for technology perhaps to advance enough to where perhaps that sharing aspect of it in those impaired bands could make that spectrum uh, appear more valuable or at least more, more usable by both sides there. Uh, I guess, I'm, I'm guessing too, they're assuming that eventually the broadcasters will need it less and less and perhaps the, the, the wireless side, uh, commercials like can use it more and more. But, but yeah, it does seem like there is some, uh, you know, hoping or assumptions or planning for uh, technology there to help in that sharing aspect and perhaps, you know, uh, uh, clear up some of that uh, confusion about the impairment part of it there. So that'll be interesting to see how that, how that kind of plays out too. But, uh, but I guess, you know, I guess in general, maybe going back to the, to the incentive auction, obviously maybe a wrap up of it. Uh, from, again, from what, you're, from what you're seeing, at least from talking to people out there, it does seem like you're seeing pretty good response from, from broadcasters. They're obviously, they're, they're very involved in this. They want to have some participation in this. Obviously make some money if they can too. I'm guessing you see some pretty good, pretty good response out there from, from broadcasters at this point. Yeah, I think you've seen a lot of broadcasters stepping up. And as we said before, right, the, the results of the AWS 3 auction, the values on that, the opening bid prices have gone a long way to entice them to participate. The other thing that's been a big lever that I think has been a wildly successful mechanism that was put in place for this auction is the whole notion of channel sharing agreements. Um, you know, that really, and, and, I'll say it, it seems to uh, have snuck up on the broadcasters a little bit. We, we saw a lot of channel sharing agreements still being negotiated right down to the wire over the holidays and even into the first, you know, first week or more of, uh, of January. But those channel sharing agreements, which enable the broadcasters, you know, in some cases to keep two sets of must carry rights for channels while sharing one channel and, and contributing the other to the auction. That has been a big win, I think, for the, for the uh, availability of Spectrum in this auction. Those channel sharing agreements really seem to be um, encouraging more people, more broadcasters to participate in the auction uh, because it gives them the flexibility for the future. And, and quite frankly, I think there's going to be you know, little bits of challenges and, and probably hiccups in the future when it comes to how you implement all of those. Yeah. Uh, you know, Getting people to, in some cases, change the physical location you know, their broadcast towers, um, you know, the governance around channel sharing. I mean, it, it's no easier than the governance around spectrum sharing in general. So, you know, we know from, from lots of history that those things will be tougher to implement uh, than, you know, many people envision. But it, it's done its job in that it's encouraged people to participate. It, it's brought the broadcasters to the table. Uh, and quite frankly, it, it's given them uh, some confidence that they can continue down there with their business, you know, while still taking some money off the table during the auction. Yeah, that's a good point. I know, I know the FCC was really big on pushing that channel sharing uh, possibility out there. I think initially when it was brought up, 
there seemed to be a lot of uh, uh, confusion or concern from the broadcaster side that, you know, was this actually a viable way to do it? But it does seem like the FCC really pushed it pretty hard and their office of technology, they're really uh, kind of laid out, hey, this is what you do. They kind of really laid out a roadmap that seemed for broadcasters to do this. So yeah, it does seem like that really uh, got a lot of those guys, guys on board with this. And uh, yeah, brought, brought them along uh, to, to kind of listen more and more and eventually they've kind of liked what they've heard. And uh, AWS3 obviously showed the money could be there. So uh, hopefully all those guys who were, who were bidding back in AWS3 still have money left over, but that's a different story altogether for uh, you know, what, the, what the bidding will be like. But, uh, but, uh, but I'm sure we'll see quite a bit of participation there. And, uh, and, I, and you, like you mentioned earlier too, I mean, you're, you're seeing perhaps we could see as much as 100, 100 plus megahertz, do you think, freed up for this, for this auction? You think once, once we get going with this? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the commission has their protocol to follow in terms of how they'll set their initial channel sharing target or channel clearing target, uh, pardon yes. me. Um, the, uh, you know, the, and, and the interesting part of that is it's not going to be as much about who actually registered for the auction as it is who didn't register <laughs> for the auction because they're obligated to keep the existing broadcasters whole yeah. uh, in this. So they really need to make sure that they've all got a home. So, you know, that initial channel sharing target, we're expecting it to be released you know, sometime in the, in the April, you know, early May timeframe. Uh, and, and, but yeah, right now, based on the, the enthusiasm from the broadcasters, it, it certainly seems like we're going to see, uh, you know, more participation and, and, you know, we'll at least see a, a lot of them, you know, getting into the early rounds and, and seeing what happens. Uh, could be some uh, some surprises, I guess, <laughs> and, yeah, and yeah. hopefully some great results for everyone. You know, quite frankly, this could be a big win-win, right? Broadcasters could take a lot of money off the table. Wireless industry could get the spectrum that it desperately needs, and the end users could could both keep the television station to you know faster, bigger pipes for broadband. So I, I think that you know, so far it's looking good for everyone. Yeah, and maybe a little extra money for the uh, for the government coffers as well, which is always a good thing. Obviously, the government's always looking to generate some additional revenues that they can, so uh, that makes everybody happy there. But uh, but again, and then like we said too, the, the auction's set to start into March. Uh, again, the first part of it will be probably a couple of months, it sounds like, with kind of the, the reverse auction part of it uh, for the first couple of months, and that will kind of set the stage for the forward auction part of it uh, going forward from that. That's correct, right? Am I getting it all right? Yep. Yeah, okay. you, got, you got it right. Yeah, the reverse auction, it, it's, it's certainly a bit confusing, but they're going to take place in a, in a sequenced uh, manner. And, uh, you know, for everybody who's, who's watching, right, the, the words to, to, uh, to focus on is uh, stages, right? This yeah. first set of a, a reverse round and a, and a forward uh, is effectively what they're calling stage one. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's possible that, that depending upon how it all plays out, we could see uh, the auction go through that stage one, maybe not quite meet the, all of the, uh, the, the, the final stage rule uh, objectives that, that are set out and, and potentially have to go into a stage two. But we're gonna, we're, time will tell whether we really uh, wind up going down that path. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a good likelihood that you know, we'll get it right in the first go round and everybody will hopefully be happy then. Fingers uh, crossed. But, Fingers know. crossed. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know more about that as we get into uh, later in the year. And, and hopefully, you know, even though we're in the, uh, the prohibited communications quiet period now and everybody can't talk too much about specifics of bids or bidding strategies, yeah. uh, you know, or really can't talk at all about them. <laughs> uh, you know, hopefully we can, uh, we, we can get some additional updates from the, uh, you know, from the government along the way as to how things are playing out. Yeah, I know for myself, at least for, for the media, I know as we cover these auctions, I know we cover it here, like the past auctions, we usually cover it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they usually put out some information for us. I know this one here is going to be a whole different story for us. Uh, I know uh, at least I'll be, uh, you know, searching the FCC site on a nonstop basis, <laughs> incentive auction page, trying to get some information from my can as much as I can. Uh, us, us Spectrum auction nerds uh, like these things. And uh, again, it'll be difficult for us to kind of follow, I think, as closely as we have in the past. But, but again, once the process gets going, I'm, I'm hoping, that, you know, obviously the FCC has been fairly open uh, or tried to be fairly open as much as it can with what's been going on. So we'll see how it kind of plays out, uh, at least what they're able to announce uh, publicly on what's going on. So uh, again, we'll see, uh, we'll kind of see and cover it and see what's happening there. And again, it could be a, again, a six month, seven month, eight month process, but uh, uh, it's gonna be fun to watch. And again, a very uh, groundbreaking auction uh, for the FCC and for the whole, you know, spectrum community in general, even worldwide, how this all plays out. So 
Uh, and obviously, it sounds like from you guys, we'll see some good, uh, some good action, I'm guessing, from, from this auction. You know, it, it's been a great opportunity to work with our clients, both in the wireless side and on the broadcast side, to, to help them understand the auction and how they can really optimize that for the strategies that they want to pursue for their businesses. Um, I, I think it's going to be very exciting to see what happens with the broadcasters after this. Um, a lot of the broadcasters that we're working with have some pretty, uh, some pretty unusual and exciting plans for what they might do you know, with the, with the, the cash that they free up from the auction. Uh, I think we could see some real innovation in the media space, you know, as a result of this auction, some reinvestment uh, in what happens. So that, that's going to be an exciting opportunity. And I think, you know, in the end, we're all really part of this sort of communications media and telecom ecosystem. Yeah. And, and for us, you know, this, this is going to be a great potential for some reinvestment in this space. And, and it may well spark that next wave of innovation that none of us knows, you know, what to expect just yet. Yeah. yeah. And again, it depends on who wins the spectrum on the other side as well. It could be some innovative companies out there, you know, uh, the Silicon Valley crew could uh, come out there and win some spectrum and maybe this time actually do something with it. And yeah, it could be a whole different world out there. Uh, you know, a couple of years from now, it could be a, a different playing field when it comes to uh, telecommunications and entertainment and media, it could be a whole different world. So uh, interesting to watch. Well, hey, Dan, definitely appreciate the great insight on this. Obviously, it is a topic that uh, I know I could talk with you about for hours and hours. I know I've, I've chewed, you off, chewed, chewed you off before on this, but, uh, but again, we definitely appreciate the great insight on this. And as this process moves along, uh, hopefully we can touch base again soon and kind of catch up on what's happening with this and uh, get some more insight on it. But uh, we definitely, again, appreciate the, the great insight today on this. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Dan. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks again. Well, that'll do it for this week's Carrier Wrap. Thanks for watching this week's show. And I want to again want to thank our guests, uh, Dan Hayes from PwC, as well as our managing editor here, Sean Kenny, for joining us. Well, make sure to check us out again next week. Thanks for watching.